Hi everyone. Welcome to our home and to our third Sunday Supper with our family, where we talk with special guests and you about important issues around our state and about Mike's campaign for Attorney General. We hope you're doing well. We know the coronavirus is impacting many of our neighbors, and so we hope you'll join us in supporting local food banks because the lines are long and they're starting to run low on food. Today, we'll discuss how to address homelessness after the coronavirus. We're joined by three leaders from local government, government. Mary Cuny, who is a Spokane County Commissioner. Mary, can you say hi? How are you doing? Good evening. Hi, Mary. We're also joined by John Nering, who's mayor of Marysville, Snohomish County's second largest city. Is John out there? Hi there, good to see you both. Great. Hi, John. Thanks, John. And State Senator Hans Zeiger, who's now running for Pierce County Council. Do we have- Good Lois afternoon, now? thank you. Fantastic. There's okay. Hans. Great, I will now hand this over to Mike. Thank you, Camille, <laughs> and thank you all for joining us. Um, we know that homelessness and related public safety issues were uh, the top concern for voters in our state before the coronavirus. And um, that issue is a big part of the reason why I decided to run for attorney general. I wanted to use my experience bringing people together to help solve this problem. I've learned over my decades of experience that to solve big problems, you first have to listen to people that have experience, to learn from their experience so that you can figure out what makes sense in terms of how to move forward on the issue. So that's what we're gonna to do today. We're gonna to listen to three of our leaders around the state who are gonna share with us their experiences in dealing with homelessness in their communities. Now, in my view, homelessness is part humanitarian crisis and part a public safety crisis. In fact, that humanitarian crisis uh, language I've shamelessly stolen from Hans Zeiger, who you'll hear from in a minute, uh, my dad was a homeless refugee in Europe at the end of World War II, and he taught me that it took both America's compassion and its respect for the rule of law to help those refugees or refugees like him who were among the huddled masses to help lift them up to a better life. So we'll talk today about both compassion and respect for the rule of law as it relates to homelessness. I will also, on a personal note, say that uh, I've been proud to serve with them um, on uh, the board of Mainstream Republicans of Washington, where I was chair until uh, last week. Um, all three of our guests have served on that board at one point in time or another. Uh, and I'm really excited and proud that John Nearing has uh, agreed to um, replace me as chair of the board. And I, I know in particular, the board is very excited to have me move on, John, and to have you um, take over for me leading the organization. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, for those of you that are watching, please send your questions by way of comments on the Facebook page. My son Grant is off screen here. He's monitoring the questions and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. There is a bit of a delay, um, so we may not get to them as quickly as we would like, but we will do our best. Okay, well, let's start the program. Um, so we know that homelessness was one of the top issues in our state prior to the virus. I'd like each of you to share with uh, the listeners um, what is driving homelessness concerns in your community and if the virus has affected that in any way, let us know. And Mary, I think we'll first start with you and then John and then Hans. So um, Mary, uh, just by way of background, as, as Camille mentioned, um, she is a county commissioner for Spokane County. Homelessness was one of the top issues in the Spokane mayor's race last year. And Mary, I'd, I'd like to start by um, asking you, um, how, have, how has that issue played out since the mayor's race last year? And then any other thoughts you have about homelessness? Yes, thank you. Uh, and thank you for bringing this topic up because it still is an important topic uh, across the state and across the nation. So uh, in Spokane, we look at it as a regional approach and it, it definitely was one of the big topics in the mayor's race last year uh, for a city of Spokane. Um, but in Spokane County, we look at it regionally and so Spokane County um, puts their dollars into the city of Spokane. 
because that way we have the services are downtown, the bus services downtown. Um, a lot of those wraparound services that the homeless need um, kind of lie in the uh, downtown Spokane area. And so that's why it really was a big issue for the mayor's race in Spokane County, having that be kind of the regional hub. Um, and we see people come from, you know, Idaho, uh, many of the counties around us, you know, since they're smaller counties, we tend to get a lot of that um, flow of homelessness into our area for those services. So we have tried to really look at it from a regional approach, um, which then has caused issues in downtown where, you know, you've got businesses and uh, convention traffic and all of that, uh, where you then have more of that homelessness, you know, out visible for the public. Uh, so, so that's been kind of, I think was one of the big issues for us. You know, since the virus has happened, you know, you know, with trying to get distancing now, you know, we uh, looked at uh, Department of Commerce gave us a grant that came into Sp Spokane County that then we had City of Spokane be the lead agent on. So again, it's, it's trying to have that regional approach, um, you know, trying to then open up another shelter facility so we can have that distancing. We opened up, you know, an isolation facility at the Spokane Fairgrounds. Uh, so as there was anyone that was homeless that had that, they could go or have symptoms, they could go and be in a separate facility uh, for isolation purposes. And, and so far in Spokane County, we've been very successful with the, the virus part of it with the homeless that we haven't seen. I think we've seen one person who's had it uh, tested positive. Um, so we're very fortunate. I think we're, we know we're not out of the woods yet. Um, so we're still working on that. And then it's, it, as you said, the law enforcement side, uh, you know, we're looking at having a mental health crisis stabilization center here in Spokane County uh, to help with that. So that way, as um, you know, if, if there's something happening out there and the police need to be involved, they can then take them to this facility, uh, much like I think Snohomish has a similar facility and uh, King County as well. Um, to try to divert them so they're not just going into jail because a lot of times we'll see that um, you know misdemeanors are happening and so then then they're ending up in in our criminal justice system and, and we don't that's not really the best place for them so, so it's been a lot of a lot of conversation a lot of work to try to figure out what is going to be best for uh, Spokane County and best for the homeless um, issues. Great, uh, thank you, Mary. Uh, now, John, for you. Um, you are the mayor of what I think is the second largest city in Snohomish County. Correct. And you've received uh, both statewide and I think even national recognition for some of the innovative work uh, you're doing in your town and surrounding areas. Um, before we get to all that innovation, I'd just like to get your sense of what, what's creating the homelessness uh, crisis in Snohomish County or in your community. And if, if it's getting better or worse, I know you're spending a lot of time as the mayor working on the coronavirus. Um, and so first off, I'll thank you for joining us because uh, yeah. I know you're stretched pretty thin, but what what does it look like from a Snohomish County perspective? Yeah, it, uh, in Snohomish County, I think one thing we've been really honest about, uh, and I know I've done myself here in Marysville, is that I, I think, think so. sometimes we we do a disservice to this um, whole effort when we, when we just refer to it as a homeless crisis. Um, it's largely driven by drugs and uh, um, in the abuse of, of some form of substances. The vast majority of the homeless on the streets of Snohomish County is certainly in Marysville. That is the root of the problem. Now that is not exclusive. There is no doubt that there are uh, truly tragic cases of homeless with people who are there down on their luck uh, or you know, victims of domestic violence, things of that nature. Absolutely there's that there, but the, the explosion of the homeless problem, uh, homelessness problem has come from uh, drug abuse and so we need to get at the root of that problem and be honest about it if we're truly to solve the homeless problem. And that's really been the crux of our program. And I don't know if you want me to go into that now or, or, or whatnot, but that's, that's the root of the problem that we've gone after. And I think why we have seen some success and the numbers are improving in Snohomish County and in Marysville, they're improving greatly. I'd say over the last year and a half ago, since uh, we've all kind of unified behind this embedded social worker approach. Okay, we'll get to the solutions part in just a minute. Uh, thank you, John. Um, and then finally, uh, as kind of an introduction, Hans Zeiger, who's now a state senator, um, <clears throat> is running for Pierce County Council. And Hans, you've really been a leader in my mind. You were the first 
Republican or one of the first Republicans to be talking about the need to address uh, homelessness and related issues, both in your community and a statewide basis. And you've uh, introduced many very innovative ideas, some of which have become law and some of which are um, waiting to become law. And we'll talk about those in a minute. But if you could just kind of paint the picture for how homelessness, how the problem looks to you and if the virus is having any effect on that right now. Yeah, appreciate it, uh, Mike. Thanks. And, you know, as I've thought, particularly this year, about how do we frame the issues of homelessness that we've had to deal with in the legislature, um, you know, we saw polling just before this legislative session that this is the number one issue facing the legislature. And of course, the, the landscape of issues is completely uh, upended now with COVID-19 and, and what's on people's minds. But it, but that doesn't change the fact that there remains a very significant issue of homelessness in communities all across our state. And uh, we do need to continue to think about how are we gonna address this issue? Um, so as I think about framing that, I think there are four realities that we have to face. Um, the reality that people are facing housing insecurity uh, and that's exacerbated in this COVID-19 crisis. The reality that people are suffering from substance use disorder and mental illness, and um, and, and Mayor Naring is absolutely right to focus on the the increase of substance use disorder and, and how that is driving homelessness. Um, uh, the, and, and then the third reality is that people are facing unsafe conditions uh, as we think about the public safety implications of homelessness. And then finally, people are living and dying on our streets. So those four realities taken together form the picture. We've got to address all four aspects of that. Uh, if we're going to be successful in uh, reducing homelessness throughout our state. And we can't just say, well, we're going to address one aspect of that or another. Um, we have to address all four aspects of that situation that we're facing in our state. Um, here in Pierce County, where I live, uh, we've seen instances of COVID-19 uh, among our homeless population. And, um, and so that is a, a, a challenge that we're facing and uh, some temporary Shelter sites have been closed. Um, and so, but I know that we've got some really effective leaders in our county who've been trying to address that situation. We've got a great county executive, Bruce Dammeyer and his team, and they've been doing really great work to, uh, to lead the public health effort here in Pierce County. Thank you, Hans. Um, one of the things that maybe gets lost when we talk about big public policy issues like homelessness is the, the personal stories. It's part of why I've talked about my father being homeless uh, in Europe as a refugee. It makes it very personal to me when I think about people living on the streets. And I'd like to ask each of you for one story that you uh, think of, or maybe you've experienced that, that helps for you to personalize uh, the homelessness uh, situation that, that you're working on so hard. Uh, John, let's start with you and then we'll do Hans and, and Mary. Yeah, I think to me, the most moving one is um, I was uh, sought out by uh, someone in our community. This was probably, I don't know, close to a year ago now who contacted me through someone else and said, hey, um, you know, I'm the ex-spouse of this individual and probably the only one that cares about him anymore. Um, he is, uh, he's sitting in, in jail, you know, you guys had offered him help with treatment and he refused it. And so pro you pro you know, we prosecuted his crimes and put him in jail. He, um, he's at his wits end. He's had a detox in jail. He knows if he gets out, he will go back out into the homeless lifestyle, into a camp and, uh, start using again. And he'll be right back. Um, you know, either dead or in this situation again, can you please send, send the social worker back up and uh, offer him help? So we did that. Um, and this individual um, uh, got through detox, got through a treatment program. I got another text through this individual, through the person that they had, had contacted me through um, after that and said, hey, just want to say thank you. He is back reunited, uh, coming to my kids, coming to our kids, uh, little league games and sports games. Um, spending time with them, doing well. A second text came a few months later. Hey, wanted to say thank you again. Here's an update. He's still clean. Uh, he's now contributing financially to the family uh, for the first time in a long time, maybe ever since he had gotten uh, out, was out homeless and, and addicted. Um, 
And then the third one, which was the most moving one, came right before the holidays this past year with a picture uh, of him and his children. And he was still clean, now had a full-time job, um, and really kind of had reintegrated fully back into the family and financial support uh, there. So it really showed me that there is hope for everybody um, in this situation, whether they're there through no fault of their own or whether they've gotten mixed up in some kind of substance issue. And that's why we do what we do. We, um, we offer the help that we offer because everybody can, if given a chance, everybody can make it out of this lifestyle. Um, I do think you have to have some heavy accountability measures on the other end, but that personal story to me was so moving and it really motivated me to just double down um, on, this, uh, on this whole program. Thank you, John. Now, uh, Hans, how about you? <clears throat> yeah, well, I can think of, you know, different individuals I've interacted with, people who are experiencing homelessness. But, you know, one thing that really has shaped my thinking about the challenges we're facing is an experience that I had visiting uh, the Metropolitan Development Council in Tacoma about four years ago. And they have a 16-bed uh, detox facility for people to voluntarily uh, check in for substance use treatment. Uh, it's a five-day program, and um, and and I asked them, you know, what is the demand for your services in a county where there are very few other uh, drug treatment options that are available for folks? And uh, they they indicated they were getting at that time six to eight hundred calls a month from people who are voluntarily wanting within a a window of willingness where they are willing to get help with uh, with an addiction to go in and get that service. But, but in many cases, people were having to go to King County to find services or probably were not getting services at all. They were going back into their addictions. Um, and that's not just a picture about homelessness, but certainly as, as we've already been discussing, that is a contributing factor to homelessness in a serious way. And if we're not providing the treatment resources for folks who are addicted out in our communities, uh, we're, we're going to continue to fight this battle in a, in a losing way. We've got to take that, th those, those uh, treatment needs seriously. Uh, so that was a real wake up call to me, hearing about the demand that's there and um, our lack of services in Pierce County. We've since gotten better in some respects. We've opened um, 120 bed um, uh, behavioral health hospital in Pierce County, but the needs continue to be great. And uh, we have a big responsibility at the state level as well to address these issues. Thank you, Hans. And um, last but not least on this topic, Mary. Did we? Oh, Mary, you might be muted. There we go. I'll do that. There Thank you go. You. Okay. Um, nice so kitchen, by the way. <laughs> Um, so a couple of stories that, that I have is, so I'm on the board of Hutton Settlement, which is a, a home for children. And so we see a lot of the, several of the kids that come to Hutton Settlement are coming to us because um, they're in situations where their parents can't take care of them. Um, some of them are living in their cars and, and are, you know, homeless. Uh, some of it's through substance abuse uh, and, you know, are becoming homeless. And so, you know, we're having those children uh, come to Hutton. And so we work really hard to work with uh, different services to help uh, with those parents so we can do reunification because that's the ultimate goal. Uh, because one thing that we see with the homelessness, um, especially when you have kids involved, is the trauma that's on those kids. And so that just continues that cycle. Um, and it's, it's really hard and really tough on them. And so it's a lot of work with with kids, and if they're not in a situation where they can get help, um, then we see that cycle happen. In Spokane County and in, in City of Spokane, we we are doing the, um, you know, added the behavioral health to the with the police and the deputies, and we're seeing great results from that. Um, and talking to the one of the Spokane County deputies, um, the he's you know, been very excited about the program, having Frontier Behavioral Health in the cars with them because they're able to then help those people right there on the spot, um, try to figure out services that they can get to and get, get the need for them um, and get them the help instead of, you know, getting, keeping them into the system. Um, but this, 
you know, and, and then there's the, you know, the stories of where things have gone wrong, where, you know, a gentleman had, you know, was homeless, was getting help, uh, was clean, uh, getting an apartment, low income housing, you know, the deposit was put down for him. And then two days later, he was kicked out because he was using again. So it's that how do we help? So that way we make sure that that, you know, once they're, you know, getting help and, and, you know, getting their life together, that we can keep them out of that situation and, and kind of keep the, the, the drugs and stuff away from them. And so that's part of, you know, what I, I see here. Great. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Well, now let's start talking about um, solutions. Each of you has been a leader in your community um, and uh, statewide and to some extent nationally on homelessness. Um, so I'd like you to tell me what you think is working. Maybe if there are some things we've tried that um, haven't worked and things that you think we should be trying or being uh, doing more of uh, to deal with homelessness and related issues. And um, Hans, we'll have you lead off on this since um, you've been, as I said earlier, very innovative and willing to try, or at least propose trying many different things. And uh, many of them seem to be working. And some, as I said, are still, you're still working on it, but they sound like really good ideas to me. So uh, tell us tell us what you're working on and what you okay. think uh, you've done that has worked. So I'll mention uh, two things that we're currently doing in Washington State, but ought to do more of. And... Um, one thing that uh, we're not doing, but we should be doing. So the, the two things that we're doing right now is um, diversion, uh, homelessness diversion, which uh, more and more cities and counties are seeing uh, for, as a positive for a variety of reasons. Pierce County is doing some tremendous work on homelessness diversion, partnerships between the county, associated ministries, the United Way of Pierce County, um, Catholic Community Services, and others who say, okay, when somebody shows up in the homeless entry, a coordinated entry system, we need to do everything we can at that moment to make sure that we can divert, literally divert them out of homelessness. If that means a month's rent, if that means uh, a car, um, car repair, if that means um, providing travel for them to a loved one, maybe in another state where there is some social capital to provide a support network in their life to help them with whatever they're dealing with. Um, Okay, so diversion is something we need to do more of. It's happening uh, in, in uh, several counties, but a lot of counties and cities that would like to do more in that, in that way uh, find resources very scarce. We were able to get some money into the um, operating budget this year to help local governments with that need. The second thing that's happening um, in some cities throughout our state, including uh, Seattle, uh, Spokane for a little while, um, and in Auburn, and Tacoma and Vancouver is employment programs for homeless individuals. And uh, when individuals who are homeless, who have barriers to employment, whether that be a criminal record, whether that be it's very difficult to get in and apply for a job, um, maybe there are gaps in somebody's employment history where it's difficult to present yourself to an employer in that way. But, but if people are willing to work, let's provide opportunities for them to do that. And uh, the, the program that I'm most familiar with is one in Tacoma uh, that is contracted with a great organization called Vallejo Vocation, where they are currently working with 20 homeless adults, uh, most of whom are uh, dealing with some substance abuse issues. And um, they're able to get them on a pathway, first of all, for some short-term uh, work, often, you know, beautification of downtown areas, things like that. Uh, but the goal is to get them into longer term employment and a training component uh, with the eventual goal of self-sufficiency. And that's really key as we talk about homelessness, because I think we've got to keep that goal in mind when we're when we're talking about effective interventions. So those, those are two things happening in Washington State. We need to do more of those things. The third thing that I want to mention that we should do, but we're not doing is what is called what, what's been called guardianship or in other parts of the country, conservatorship. Senator Steve O'Ban from Pierce County proposed a bill to allow for uh, a guardianship program where a, an individual could petition a court to basically take care of the, the health care needs of a loved one who is experiencing behavioral health challenges, uh, drug, drug abuse challenges or mental illness issues in their life. And we need that resource. Families are, are crying out for resources to help loved ones, but they're just such limited resources. We have uh, we, we, in recent years, we've done a bit to strengthen involuntary uh, 
treatment, but that, that only goes so far. And so a guardianship law where somebody could petition a court in that way to take care of a loved one would really, really make a difference. And we need that resource in Washington State. Thank you, uh, Hans. And um, now, Mary, to you. I know uh, Spokane County and the city of Spokane have been working jointly on some programs. Um, so you might talk a little bit about that and, and other things uh, that you've seen that work in Spokane and greater Spokane. You might be muted. There we go. I must do it every time then. Okay. Um, so Hans is absolutely right with the diversion facilities. So in Spokane County, we are working to uh, build a mental health crisis stabilization center diversion facilities. So that way, you know, first responders, you know, when they see the crisis happening out on the streets, they can bring somebody instead of currently, you know, they're taking them either to the hospital or to the jail. Um, and so now there's, you know, there'll be a facility coming online, you know, within a year, we hope, um, so that they can, you know, divert them to that. And again, with, with that, um, similar to like King, how King County has the 24 to 72 hour 16 bed facility, um, we are hoping to then add on to that and have a facility that could be, you know, for detox and to, for substance abuse. So that way then we can actually get them sustained long-term, um, help, uh, you know, because currently I think in Spokane County, you know, you know, if people want to get into treatment, they've got to wait to get into treatment. If they're having to wait to get into treatment, you know, the chances of them getting that, you know, go down every day. So we need to make sure that we have that immediate need handled um, so people can get the help they need right when they need it. Uh, the other thing that we're doing in Spokane County that's unique is uh, through the Associated General Contractors, there's a program called Head Start to Construction that Spokane County, City of Spokane, and several other organizations help fund, where um, it's been very successful in our jail system that we can do a six-week program with these um, individuals. Uh, and it's not just in the jail, but, you know, Spokane County, we've seen a huge, uh, uh, I would say, people that don't reoffend coming out of this program. Uh, and it's been very successful that, you know, they, they take six weeks, it's kind of a, you know, they do yoga, they do affirmations, they do positive, you know, image training, and then they're doing construction skills. So they're getting their flagging card, they're getting their OSHA training. So when they, they come out, um, then we can help them because we've helped several of them then get low income housing, uh, otherwise they would be homeless and they would be on the streets. And so with that, uh, some of the people that I've talked to, I usually speak at the graduations, they're getting jobs, you know, some of them with the city, um, some in construction, in all the different industries, whether it's drywalling or, you know, working in, in housing. And with that, then one of the guys that just recently spoke at one of the graduations, you know, he's like, my criminal history was awful. Nobody would have taken a chance on me. You guys took a chance on me. I've been able to turn my life around and I bought a house, I'm buying a car, I'm you know, making $40 an hour in construction. And he says, I, you know, I would have been on the streets and stealing. So he's like, it's, it's a program that really has turned him around. And I know for recidivism, um, the deputies at a Geyer Correction Facility where, you know, we have the program, they're like, we don't see these people coming back. We would normally see them as repeat offenders. And again, they'd be couch surfing, you know, all those things that um, would not be productive to society. And so now they're, they're happy and they're productive. So that's been one program that's been really successful for us that we'd like to see, you know, more of that happen. But, you know, and, and again, I think it's feeling like if you can give somebody a hand up and, and a job, they're gonna be successful. Mary, I've got a follow-up question. I'm gonna paraphrase a question that came um, uh, via Facebook. You were an auditor at the state level and also at the county level. And one of the questions that uh, I get asked and others ask is, you know, how do we how do we make sure that the money we're spending on issues related to homelessness that it's being spent well? Are there metrics that have been uh, developed? Do we need to develop metrics? Um, you know, accountability mechanisms. Um, where's our money going, and and is it being spent well? It's a very good question and, and something that is very important to all of us as elected officials. We want to make sure that we're spending the taxpayers and our constituents' money 
appropriately. Um, and so it does come down to having those measurements and, and metrics in place that we can see, is this program being successful or is this program not? And can we then rearrange the funding? So if a program's not, you know, we're seeing that it's not successful, that we can, you know, kind of midterm in a contract say, okay, we tried this, it's not working, so we're gonna put the money elsewhere. Um, I think that's what we need to start seeing. We in Spokane County, I know through our continuum care group, they have put together a five-year plan and have put metrics in it and measurements in it for the first time. So it's gonna be really important for us to watch that and monitor that. Um, and I think as elected officials, that's a key issue for us to, to look at and continue to ask those questions. Okay, um, thank you. And uh, John, um, I know you, you've got some very innovative programs in the city of Marysville and in Snohomish County. Um, can you tell us what those are and how they're working? Yeah, thank you. Um, so we have a, uh, a two-pronged approach with our uh, embedded social worker program, or you can call it, some, some cities would call it a navigator program. Well, what that is, essentially, we have a full-time social worker that goes out with a full-time police officer. Their only job is to deal with this issue, to find people that are dealing with mental health or more often than not uh, substance abuse issues and really try and everything possible to get them into detox and treatment and get them back uh, a second chance at life again. How that works, I've been out with this team. They're, they're tremendous at it. You know, um, we took some folks to McDonald's and other places and met with them. So I got a real uh, eye-opening view of, of how this works. Went out and some people into makeshift tents out in the woods and whatnot. But essentially they'll meet with them on multiple occasions to build some trust, um, get them some food, et cetera and just really try and talk them into taking this route. And they're fairly patient. Um, and the idea is get them into detox, get them in front of somebody who can determine whether they need a 30, 60 or 90 day program, uh, what they need. And then um, on the back end of that, when they get through that program, they have some temporary housing that's available and some job training, hopefully, and, and a second chance, like I said, at life. The key is having that social worker. Police officers are not trained in, nor do they have the time or the ability to navigate all of the bureaucracy around obtaining these services through Medicare, or I'm sorry, through Medicaid or private insurance, or there's a group called PARI, a national group called PARI around the country that scholarships this kind of thing. So our social worker does that. And I think it's key to hire the right type of social worker that, that believes in accountability and believes in what you're doing. The second prong of this approach was I think is something that we really believe in strongly and maybe where some others um, haven't aren't as strong a belief. I know in some of the panels I'm in with some of the some other cities, they don't believe in this as much. But the idea is, is that, hey, we're going to give you every chance. And our social worker and officer are very patient. But if we get the runaround, and if you're just not interested, if you just want to be left alone to steal from uh, Kohl's and Costco and Target and everywhere else, and do drugs every night and leave dirty needles all over the community, and that's it, break into people's cars and garages, if that's the lifestyle you are committed to leading, you're not really welcome to do that in Marysville anymore. And so again, we'll give you every opportunity over several weeks to make the right choice. If you don't, then we're gonna prosecute all those outstanding crimes. Typically, most of these people do have a rap sheet and that would include trespassing. We'll trespass them on private property. We've worked hard throughout the city to get a lot of our um, commercial spaces to sign over uh, trespass authorization to our police department um, so that they're not allowed to stay there anymore. And we will, you know, we will prosecute those. The reason I know that works is um, the story I told you just a little while ago. There's multiple stories like that. Our social worker could tell you some, I could tell you others. Um, when I met with our team at the beginning of this year to go over their goals, they said, we're spending quite a bit more time in our jail now. We have our own jail here in the city of Marysville meeting with people, um, which was very encouraging to me. That may sound counterintuitive, but what that means is the people we're putting into jail that aren't taking us up on this are doing just like that gentleman I told you uh, like about a little bit ago, and they're getting into jail where you detox in, in, a, in a natural way. Um, and they're deciding in jail, hey, I don't want this life anymore. Can they come up in the jail and give me a second crack? And that's where we do that. Now, imagine if we had just left those people out under a bridge or somewhere out in the woods and just said, well, if you're not gonna accept the help, then we'll just move on to somebody else. I just don't see how that's compassionate. Um, those people would either be dead or still strung out on heroin every night and uh, tormenting law-abiding citizens every single day 
and leaving needles all over the community, all of that. But sometimes you need a little bit of tough love that says, no, we're, we're not going to allow you. You know, we're, you're going to make a choice, but the choice is going to result in one of two things, getting the help you need or getting prosecuted for your crimes. And then on the back end, hopefully getting the help you need. That's how we operate. It's been a very successful program. We're a city of 70,000, the, the second largest in the county. In the first year and a half or so, we put over 100 people into treatment. Um, we've graduated over 50. Others are at different stages of their treatment journey. And no doubt, some have backed out and we'll pursue them to, to get back into it. But for a community our size, that's cleaned up a good portion of this problem from our streets. It used to be when I would drive home late at night from a council meeting, city council meeting or another meeting, I could find somebody tucked away and underneath a storefront or somewhere. Uh, I would come in regularly and get um, calls or emails from single moms or anybody that said, hey, I can't go fill up gas anymore without getting assaulted by, not physically assaulted, but you know, confronted by somebody who wants money. Um, and I've got a child sitting in the back seat. I'm all alone. And I'm just, I'm sitting there saying, what do I do? Do I give them a couple bucks to get rid of them? Or do I, you know, what do I do? I don't hardly get any of those calls or emails anymore. And uh, I'm not saying we don't have a homeless problem or we don't have drug addicts in our community. We absolutely do. Every community does. I'm just saying it's not so prevalent that, that you notice it almost everywhere. So uh, we have the statistics to show that it's, it's working. We also have the anecdotal evidence of our citizens telling us that and our business owners where the problem exists. And if I might, there's a couple other prongs, uh, not to take up too much time, but uh, we have a, a keep the change, give to a local charity program, which is another thing I think is really important. We encourage our citizens. We have signs all over town, businesses put them up that say, um, you know, when you contribute to the panhandling problem, you're contributing to this problem because most of those people panhandling will put that money into drugs. Not everybody, but why are we taking the chance? Give it to a local charity, the food bank, uh, we have um, a cold weather shelter. We have the Everett Gospel Mission that houses these people. There's a diversion center that does detox. There's all sorts of places you could give this money where you can guarantee that 100% of it goes to food, clothing, and shelter. When you hand it out the window, there's a good chance it's not. Um, we also finally have what's called a MESH pro program, micro emergency shelter housing, some houses that the city has purchased and that we own and that we open up um, on the, you know, for folks that are in this situation and, and maybe have gotten through treatment and, and recovering, or in some instances, it's just for, you know, we had a single mom with a couple of kids who didn't have a substance abuse program living in them at one time. It's very difficult to build a large complex, say a big um, homeless shelter in a community like Marysville. Nobody would want it near their neighborhood. It would be a source of great division. But if you buy a few houses up around the community, uh, nobody really knows that they're there. I haven't had any complaints on them and it, it really works well. I would just close with saying something that Senator Zeiger said and, and, uh, is, uh, and I think he's absolutely correct, uh, whether it's guardianship or involuntary treatment. I think our society has to come to the point to realize that we're not doing anybody any favors by letting people with mental health issues or issues like this wander the streets and do damage to themselves and to, um, to the community. We need to get them the help they need if they're not capable of, of making that kind of decision. We need to have somebody close to them who is capable of that and, uh, and try and get them into, into a facility. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, John. Um, let me follow up with Hans and then Mary, just um, in terms of how you believe that we should balance compassion and the rule of law. It sounds like the embedded service program that they have in Snohomish County really does that very explicitly. And it sounds like it's working. Um, Hans in, in Pierce County or from your perspective as a state senator and Mary in, in uh, Spokane County, how, how does that look to you? Well, you know, one of the things that's been really compelling to me is when law enforcement has said to the legislature, we need more behavioral health resources. Um, and, and certainly that goes hand in hand with enforcing the law. Uh, we had a uh, work session uh, in the legislature last year following the the airing of um, the Seattle is Dying special that got so many people talking about these issues. Um, and, one, and one of the presenters was Pierce County Sheriff Paul Pastor, and he came talking about the, just the huge need that we have for behavioral health resources. Um, and, you know, when, when law enforcement, going to things that both Mary and John have said, uh, when, when law enforcement is dealing with folks who are in crisis out on the streets, um, 
you know, just taking them into jail may not be the ideal solution. Uh, we need uh, mental health resources and drug treatment resources in our communities. And the reality is we have underfunded those for decades. And so that, that contributes a lot to the situation that we're in. Um, I, I think there's been some really good bipartisan work at the state level to try to move forward, but that's it, but it's slow progress. And that in, involves reforming Western State Hospital and involves having more community behavioral health um, facilities in our communities where people can get the help that they need close to home. And, uh, but that's gonna take a lot of additional state investment and uh, it's gotta be a priority. And, um, and there's a whole lot of other things that have uh, louder voices advocating for them when it comes to our state budget. We have made significant new uh, investments on a bipartisan basis uh, the last couple of years in the legislature. So that's, that's good news, but just a lot more work to be done on this front. Thank you, Hans and Mary. Um, so yes, yeah, so we have the embedded program as well, and and it truly has been so helpful. I think I talked about it, you know, kind of after the first question as part of the first question. But you know, being able to have the frontier behavioral health specialists in the cars with the deputies and the police, um, and and like John said, you know, they do go out and they see the same people. And so it is building that trust and helping them then get to the services they, that they need. Um, so that way then they don't end up, end up in our criminal justice system. Um, the other thing, you know, is that we are looking at that mental health diversion facility uh, because, you know, that, that is the compassionate thing to do is to, to keep them out of our criminal justice system. Um, so if they can get healthy and, and be able to get home to their families, that's going to be you know, key for them and key for those families. And like I said, I, I worry about the trauma on the kids. You know, a lot of times the, the, the children get lost in the shuffle of they're the ones that are seeing this happen and have that traumatic event happen that affects them. And so, you know, I, you know, I look at it too, is, is we all look at the full the whole family and how do we approach that whole family, you know, as these people are getting help. Um, and then the other thing that we've done in Spokane County and at the city of Spokane is put together what we call the Envision Center, um, where we've got all those services in one place, so kind of a one-stop shop. So instead of going to try to figure out how you get your health insurance and how you get, you know, unemployment or try to get, you know, look for a job, that all those services can be in one place. Um, you know, SNAP is there with rental assistance. Uh, so. So that's an important piece that we added to our community a little over a year ago um, that I think is, is trying to look at it from that holistic perspective to really help. Um, so that way, you know, as, as the need is there and people are wanting to give help, that, that there's the resources available and the places to go to, to know where to get that help. Thank you, Mary. Okay, we'll, we'll wrap up with um, kind of a joint question. Um, Elena Sampalano from Snohomish County sent us a question, um, which is, how can I help solve this crisis? So I will add to that question um, to all three of you, how can I, as the next attorney general, help solve this crisis? So you, hopefully you can answer both questions um, uh, in one. Um, and let's see, um, we'll start with uh, Mary. Uh, Mary, how do how do I, as Attorney General, and how does uh, Elena Sampolano or people like Elena who want to help, how what can we do to help? So I think for you, Mike, being uh, you know the next Attorney General for the state of Washington, uh, would be you know bringing people together to have that conversation. Uh, you know, in Spokane County, a Vista Foundation last summer knew we don't want to have another death you know, on our streets. So what, what do we need to do? And so they actually brought in all the nonprofits together that help with homelessness. And it's interesting because sometimes you think that they would all be working together, but in some ways they're all competing too. So they're, they're competing for dollars or they're, they have different ways that they're helping the homeless. Um, so, I mean, when I went to my first meeting, you know, I was the commissioner in the room and I had the gentleman from the Union Gospel Mission, the executive director sitting on one side and the executive director for the Salvation Army on the other side, you know, and normally you don't have them all in the room together talking. And so, you know, we were able to figure out that one of the things that was missing was, you know, 
when, when the evenings hit and we need to figure out where beds are available, there is no system and, and police don't have the time to call different shelters and they don't, they can't just take people to different shelters and say, oh no, this one's full. So we came up with a system um, that it was the police could call into, they could find out where beds were available and then help those people get to those beds. Uh, so, so it's having that global conversation and being that convener to bring people together uh, because I think you're seeing from just the three of us, we all have, you know, ideas and stuff that if we all came together, I think we could make really, you know, look for some even better solutions for our community and for the state. Um, and I think as a, as an individual, it's, it's getting involved. Um, there's so many nonprofits that are, are working um, and working diligently on this topic and are helping people. Um, and so I would say, you know, if, if you're able to, then, then get involved and help and, and volunteer. Thank you, Mary. Uh, let's see, John, why don't I ask you the same question? How can an individual or how can I, as the next attorney general, make a difference on this important problem? Yeah, I think uh, Mary had some really good examples there of, of ones I would say as well. But yeah, I think you would be in a unique position, Mike, um, as Attorney General, to start a real statewide conversation that, that I think is missing in some ways um, from, from executive level uh, leadership. And so you could um, rally folks to this idea of accountability for um, uh, those that aren't availing themselves of the help that is offered, uh, while at the same time providing um, uh, a push for more resources that actually work, treatment centers, job training, um, housing after people have gone through treatment. Uh, I tend to think that's more critical than, than some of the ideas of low barrier housing. I'm not saying there's no case to be made for low barrier housing, but I think what we're finding is we get people through treatment and they get three months of temporary housing and all of a sudden they're, um, they're kicked out of that. Well, why, why can somebody who refuses treatment get into low barrier housing with no questions asked and be able to you know, use substances and stuff, but those that, take, that actually do the hard thing and get through treatment uh, have a limited supply of housing? That would be another thing. Um, and then I think you, know, you, could, you could do some, some great things in partnership with folks like Hans and others who are really doing really good work in the legislature um, with some really great ideas and, and try and make those a reality. Uh, for the average citizen, I would tell you, um, A, take, you know, most of our citizens are, have really big hearts. They want to give their money. They just want to know it's going to something. If you're able to give to a place like the, I'll just cite one in Snohomish County, the Everett Gospel Mission, which does really good work behind getting people off the streets and through a mental health or a treatment program. That's a great place to give money. Food banks, um, uh, cold weather shelters that get people off the street when it's cold. We don't want anybody dying of exposure, whether they have a, no matter what their issue are. Also, I've been pleased to say that average citizens in Marysville have stepped up. And this would be, I guess, particularly if you have connections with people that own a small business or you own one yourself. If you're willing to give somebody a, a crack at a job who's been through this, that's it's just massive. Sometimes the bigger corporations have all kinds of policies. And if you've got a track record of, of drug abuse or something, you're just you're going to be hard pressed to get in there, but I had a local landscaper that gives someone a shot. You know, if you own a painting company, there's a lot of these people coming out of this lifestyle that have skills. And if you give them a shot, it increases, um, well, it, it increases the chance that they will stay clean uh, exponentially. And so that would be a big assistance. Okay. And Hans, you'll be the last word on this. How can I, as the next attorney general or just a regular citizen, uh, how can we make a difference in solving homelessness and related issues? Yeah, for regular citizens, you know, I would echo what John just said about supporting um, organizations that are helping people who are going through homelessness that that have that compassion focus, but also have an accountability focus, uh, have a track record of helping people with recovery. Uh, here in Pierce County, we've got the Tacoma Rescue Mission that's got, you know, over a century, I believe, of doing this work very effectively. Um, and so that, that's a great organization to get involved with either as a volunteer or as a contributor or both the, um, right at this particular moment, I would say it's very important to support our local food banks because uh, so many people are, uh, facing economic troubles all around us and, uh, our food banks are strained. Uh, they're experiencing demands unlike anything they've ever had before. And so we need to pitch in and support our local food banks. As far as what you can do, Mike, as Attorney General, you know, I think uh, 
when I think about going back to the question that you asked earlier about public safety uh, and the, the role that you would have uh, on issues of public safety in that office of attorney general, a few different things that we've um, talked about in the legislature or have th that I've been thinking about. One is we need to be strengthening our laws as it relates to the drug fentanyl. Uh, which is one of the most dangerous drugs ever and uh, is responsible for so many people dying out on the street. It is mixed into heroin in many cases. It is, it is multiple times more uh, powerful than heroin um, and just so dangerous. And we need to, when it comes to um, uh, endangerment of uh, kids and vulnerable adults, we need to bring our laws about the manufacturer and exposure uh, to fentanyl up to the same level as meth. A second thing we need to do is a whole lot better job of prosecuting property crimes. And I'm thinking particularly of King County when we, when we talk about that issue, but I think the state can really put some pressure on local governments that may not be doing that prosecution and uh, making sure that, it, because so often those are linked uh, to drug issues. And then the third thing that we ought to explore is uh, adding a third strike for high level drug dealers. And you know, when we talk about the drug issues that people are experiencing out on the streets, that's not just isolated to the people who are experiencing those things. There is a whole chain, a whole supply chain uh, for, for drugs to get to that point. And for those who are dealing those drugs, who are probably responsible in, in some cases for the murder of people out on, the, out on our streets, we need to hold those people to account. And uh, so for people who are in, in that, has a big business, we need to really go after them uh, with uh, and make that a third strike in our state. So those are some ideas for prosecution and for strengthening our laws. And the attorney general would have an opportunity to, to do that. Appreciate what you're doing, Mike, and running for office. Uh, you've got a, a long road ahead of you, and, and uh, we appreciate you stepping up to do this. Thank you, Hans. And talking about prosecuting drug uh, distributors, I did some of that as a volunteer King County prosecutor many, many years ago during the crack cocaine epidemic. And that was the county strategy then was to go after the dealers. Um, I prosecuted a couple of those drug dealers and sent them, sent them off to jail. Um, and uh, I'm not gonna say it was be just because of my effort certainly or that effort, but the crack cocaine epidemic did go away because of that very vigorous enforcement of uh, the drug laws. Um, and I wanna just second what some of you have said about um, helping out our food banks. Um, as uh, we read in the newspaper, they're running out of food because of the unprecedented demand. And uh, Camille and I have contributed to our both our local food bank here in Issaquah, but also to some of the statewide and regional organizations. Um, whatever you can, if you can afford to give them anything, they're really in need. And, and now is the time you can really make a difference. Well, I just want to uh, thank our three panelists, uh, Hans Zeiger, Mary Cuny, and John Nering for joining us today. Thank you for taking time out of your Sunday. Um, I want to thank my wife, Camille, who's off camera, uh, who introduced the show, and, and my son, Grant, who's also off camera. He's been monitoring the questions. Uh, and also Josh Amato, who's behind the camera for all the hard work putting this together. Um, if you want to learn more about my campaign, Go to MikeVasca.com. That's one word, MikeVasca.com. Please join our team to protect the Evergreen State. And we'd welcome any financial contribution you can make to us to help pay for programs like these and our other campaign activities. You can do that on the website. So that's it for today. Thank you very much. Uh, everyone have a great week. And uh, we'll be back again next Sunday, same time, uh, 4 o'clock for uh, another hopefully very interesting discussion about politics in our state.